And now, here's a man who has never, ever had any one of his decisions second-guessed. Because everyone around him knows they're always wrong. Here's Barry Davis. Wow. Yeah, like the decision to bring you on as a co-host? Oh! I, yes. Yep, there we go. Right? Zero experience, zero track record. Every single episode is like something that we c kind of grit our teeth and bear through. Well, I suppose you're right. Uh, today on Out of the Park, we're going to be joined by, you know, I, I was going to say a polarizing GM, but what GM in, in pro sports is not polarizing? Because if the team is winning a championship, they love the person. And if the team is not winning a championship, they are completely, what's a word worse than hate, Tom? Reviled. Oh, yes. And Alex Anthopoulos. Richardied. Yes, exactly. Uh, th <laughs> there were signs saying, you know, hashtag fire Alex after yep. after those two straight seasons where the Blue Jays did go to the postseason. Why was Alex making those moves? Did he know he was on his way out? We're going to ask him point blank, and he's going to give us an honest answer. That is coming up. He will also answer questions from, I believe, five of our OTP insiders who joined in. Yeah. Yeah, we had a full house for this one. Full house. And again, some great questions brought up by our OTP insiders. For those of you who are not insiders and you're watching the video right now on YouTube, you will see the majority of our conversation with Alex Anthopoulos. But if you want to see all of it, especially all the good stuff at the end, you have to be an uh, OTP insider. And Tom, how can someone yeah. become an OTP insider? And not only do you get to see all of these clips, but you have an opportunity to join in and ask these questions yourself. Visit us at patreon.com slash out of the park. Throw us a few bucks a month, $3, $5, anything you want. And you get to be part of the most interactive and unique sports media experience that's going right now, at least for baseball. Exactly. So we don't have a poll this week, Tom. But when we come back, we're going to talk about something that was very poll worthy and something that I tweeted about over the past week, and the response was unbelievable. Maybe we'll read some of the responses that we got from that tweet. There is Tom Forth. I'm Barry Davis, and you're listening to Out of the Park. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, the first pitch with Barry Davis. And the first pitch is brought to you by our good friends at Ballistic Sports, BallisticSports.com. And uh, Tom, like we did last week, you're going to explain what the ballistic sports games are all about, and I'm going to go grab a prop because we've got video now. And for those of you who are listening to Out of the Park right now, like you normally would, we now have the whole show out on YouTube. So go to our YouTube yep. page, Out of the Park, or NSR Media, I believe it's called. NSR Media. Yep. NSR Media. Hit the subscribe button. That's very, very important. That's really nice if you subscribe. There's no charge to subscribe. And you'll see all, of, our, all of the videos that we put up there. Uh, as well as a lot of the music videos that we've done over time and some fun things in there as well. So there you go. Ballisticsports.com. Tell us about the game, Tom. All right. So Ballistic is basically the newest, most innovative sort of sports watching companion. It's, it's board game meets your favorite baseball game or your favorite hockey game. You basically, you're watching the game and, and we're all trying to guess what's going to happen next anyway. So they made a game about it. So you actually like, are guessing what's going to happen next. And depending on how good you are at, at predicting what's happening, here it comes. You move around this beautiful board that our YouTube and Patreon viewers are watching right now. And you know what? It's, it's, we're all looking for something to do right now. I know we're all chomping at the bit for baseball season to come. I hope, I hope, hope, hope we get this full game ready for, for the start of the season. But uh, you know what? Check them out. Ballistic sports. Uh, at Ballistic underscore sport, sports on Twitter. You can find them through there and uh, support a, a local Canadian business that's, you know, trying to make your sports watching experience a lot more fun. Uh, speaking of, uh, we could definitely be using this game right now while watching a Blue Jays spring training game. And <laughs> I brought this up on Twitter when it was first announced this past week, and we didn't do a poll, but judging by the comments that were out there, I think most people are in agreement that, uh, it, it's it's better than nothing, but it's mm -hmm. terrible. And for yeah. those of you who are unaware, uh, what the Toronto Blue Jays, not Sportsnet, but the Toronto Blue Jays have done is they said, well, we need 
to give our fans something during spring training. The majority of our fans come from Canada during spring training. They're not there this year. They can't be there. They're not going to be able to see a home game, and we're talking season ticket holders and anyone who would go to a game. They're not going to be able to see a game for the foreseeable future. So at the very least, it would be nice to give those fans something that they can watch. It's not perfect. It's not close to perfect. There's no sound to begin with. And yeah. I, I, I understand. They, they don't want to take the risk, and there could be language on the field that you don't want to hear, right? But somebody suggested, hey, maybe do some kind of a, you know, show it on delay, right? Or, or hire somebody. You know, Blue Jays, hi. I'll do it for free. Yes. Me and Mike. Just let me talk over the game. Tell people what's happening. Right? Well, that, like, listen, like, they like have called the largest telecom company in Canada. You know how many sportscasters are out of work right now? Hire one of them. Hire a Canadian. You have people hired. You have a broadcast team. Mm -hmm. Right? Do the work. Do something. Give Mark a Canadian Martins. a job and make Canadian fans happy. Like it's a win-win, oh, yes. and it well, makes no it, sense. And and again, if if Sportsnet doesn't want to have Buck and Ben, who are both in Florida, who are both at every game, yeah. right? And thank, thankfully, you know, Ben's been posting some videos as well. But they're there. You have the ability, even if it's those two cruddy cameras, yeah. right? You have the ability to stick a microphone in front of Ben and Buck and say, just call the game. Just call the game. Right? You can do it over the internet. I don't care if the sound quality isn't great. I don't care if they're doing it over the phone. I just want to hear play-by-play -play of a baseball game. I want to hear stories of the players I'm watching. And it almost seems like it might even be worse when we're exposed to the Yankees broadcast or the Pirates broadcast or whatever team they're playing because it's all about the other team. Sometimes they're interesting stories, but Blue Jay fans want to hear about their team. They want to know what's going on. And that does not apply this year. And even in years, Tom, when they had very limited games on TV, you could still listen to either every game on the radio or more recently on the internet, on, on the fan website. Yep. Yeah. And, and they started doing that with spring training a few years ago. Yeah. And um, I let, remember because it would hurt me. <laughs> Like yeah, give, yeah. let Ben give him a freaking laptop and a microphone or have him do it directly into his phone or something and put it up on their website. Yeah. There's Wi Fi yeah, there. I could, I could play the devil's heated. advocate. See this? I'm, I know. I'm getting a little hot. I know. You know what? But like for our, for our listeners out there, I, I could play the devil's advocate. I could say, well, maybe there's things that we're not thinking about. We're fans, we're passionate, right? You know, maybe there's a reason why they can't make this happen. Then right? tell us, but 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 tell us, but but do something, right? Because optically, for a telecom company, Rogers has made some really questionable decisions, right? At a time when they could generate so much goodwill in Canada by just even something as simple as this, like you know what? Here's some here's entertainment. We know it's popular. We know it can bring Canadians together. You know, you can't come out to the ballpark but we're going to figure out some way to support this team loud enough that they hear it in the States, right? They could get behind that, but instead they're just like, ah, we don't care. And, and Canadians, like we've been locked up in our houses in our areas for three months. Yep. People are having a hard time. And this could make a, a considerable difference in the mental health of people. And, you know, for people with disabilities, like blind, uh, blind fans of the Jays, right? There are There's many. And I, I've so, spoken to so many yeah. of them over the years when I worked in radio and that's why another reason why the radio broadcast to me is so important. But getting back to the whole idea of, of the games being televised, um, you know, what we are seeing is that there are a limited number of fans in these ballparks. And this year, every team except the Blue Jays has announced a limited number of fans will be allowed in their stadium to watch their teams, except for two teams. One, the Blue Jays, because they're not going to be playing in Toronto. And number two is the Texas Rangers, because they did not announce that a select number of fans will be allowed. They, they announced them all, in. all of them. Mm -hmm. So 
I am a firm believer that we need to find a way to safely get the world moving again. We've been in this for a year now, and most of us have done everything that we are supposed to do. So I am fine with 25, 30%. Give some people a chance to get out and enjoy the world again. Filling the stadium at complete compa capacity where they're not going to be following safety protocols. People are going to be eating hot dogs and drinking beers and stuff like that. Whether you are a believer or not in masks, whether you're a believer or not in the severity of this, I think we're going to see uh, a pretty bad spike in numbers before long in, Arling in the Arlington area. Uh, to me, this is just a recipe for disaster. And I know you've got very strong thoughts on this whole thing as well, so I'll let you explain what you have to say about it as well, okay. if your opinion differs from mine at all. But I just think that there's a smart way to do it, and then there's an absolutely ridiculous way to do it, and this is beyond ridiculous. I would say, I mean, with any sort of political thing like this, right? I, who's being spectrum. political? How, how am I? Be, well, how is this COVID, political? No, 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 no. Oh, no, not you. But COVID has become political. Right? Yeah, and it's we're stupid. Like, Texas's, why? Yeah, we're questioning Texas's decision, and and you know, Texas is questioning Delaware's decision, and Delaware's questioning Boston's decision, and everybody's questioning Sweden's decision, and and you know, I think the important thing that often gets lost, certainly in mainstream media in Canada is that there's like hundreds of countries out there and every one of them is dealing with COVID in a different way. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I'm somebody with young children. I'm somebody with my grandmother in a, a long-term care home. I'm somebody who lost a business because of COVID. So, you know, I can appreciate everything from the need to keep people safe to the need to find a sustainable way forward. Um, as a Canadian, um, watching Texas open up, I think we should have our eyes and ears open and, and, and look because all those disasters that we were told were going to happen in Florida and, and Texas, and you know, they, they haven't happened. And now how long has Florida been wide open? A long time. Has it? Like I knew that they and, were, and, they were opening. I just didn't know they were full on open. Well, it's different down there. Cause it's the same, I, I believe as, as it is here in Canada, different counties, right? Like, you know, some counties in Florida have, uh, in Florida have mask restrictions. Some counties don't, and and it's again, it's one of those things where in Canada we have like the federal, provincial, municipal. They have the exact same thing down there, but but, mm -hmm. but by and large, they've chosen to take a path that's far more open. Right. Um, my brother in Finland is you know right beside Sweden, who took a, a, their path as well, and you know. I think that we should stop getting like outraged and, and scared by what's happening elsewhere and try and look at it dispassionately because I, as, as a father of young children in Ontario, as a business owner, as someone who used to run restaurants, as someone whose grandmother right now is dying isolated in a long-term care home. Um, if we, if we're happy with how we're getting through this, I don't I, I don't think we can be right. And so I think we should be looking at things like Texas and going, hey, what are they doing? Let's see how this works out. Well, let's we see. Get so angry? Well, yeah. The thing is, it, I mean, <laughs> we as a country have been very reactive instead of proactive. So I'm sure they're going to monitor the situation very closely and see how things go in Texas. Right. Yep. I mean, they're meanwhile, uh, is it? Italy or the UK that just went into another lockdown. Italy, yeah. right? Italy. So I mean, you know, the thing is, well, it, well, I mean, me, we're we're in a lockdown here, right? Well, and, we are, but we're not, Tom. I mean, we've never been in a in a lockdown. We've never been in a real lockdown. And I mean, when I say lockdown, I mean being able to go to Walmart and shop for an iPhone uh, during that. That if that was closed, then that's a lockdown, right? Right now, the whole purpose to me, and here we go getting all political again, the purpose to me of a lockdown is a lockdown. You can't do a half lockdown and expect it to work. You can't lock down, you know, peel, but then leave open, you know, bury, right? Yeah. It can't, it doesn't work that way. Because it almost defies common sense, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's like it's like we'll we'll kind of lock down, but not all the way. So the virus is still going, and then we'll open back up, and then we'll yell at everybody because you're not doing your job by going grocery shopping, by but whatever. But like, 
as a mental health advocate, I'm just going to say like all over Ontario, we've got 30 million people that haven't seen their families. My kids haven't seen their cousins mm-hmm. in months. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm all for locking down, but if we're going to do it all the way, let's do it all the way. But if, but we're not doing it all the way. No. So I think we're lingers. at the point now. Right. Yeah. If we had done, we, if we had done a full scale lockdown for a month, 18 six days or whatever ago. this stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. We probably wouldn't be in the situation we're in today. But again, the people who make the decisions probably when they make the decisions think it's a fantastic idea. And then when it doesn't work, they're looked at as making a bad decision. Kind of sounds like the life of a GM in baseball, doesn't it, Tom? It does, right? Everybody's second guessing. Everybody has their own wants and needs that they want you to look after. Mm-hmm. And in just a little while, we're going to talk with former Toronto Blue Jays GM Alex Anthopoulos about that lifestyle. Uh, every move that a GM makes, when they're making it, they think it's a fantastic move. And most people agree it's a great move. But when it fails, everyone forgets that they actually like the move when it happened. They just remember. So we're going to talk to Alex about a lot of that coming up. But first of all, uh, Tom, the, the Blue Jays do have an injury concern already in camp. And Raj Sapai is going to join us now to talk about that. There's Tom Forth. I'm Barry Davis, and you're listening to Out of the Park. Foundation Physiotherapy presents The Medical Room. And joining us, as he does each and every week, is Raj Sapaya from Foundation Physiotherapy. Four locations, because we now call the virtual location its own location, Raj Sapaya. Um, hopefully in the next little while, uh, you'll be opening up again soon. If you could be given any indication when that's going to happen. We are open. Oh, we're open. Hallelujah. We're, yeah, yeah. We've been, we've been open uh, throughout the whole the, the whole time because oh, we're that's an essential, right. You have. We're an essential service, right? So yes. we we you, nobody has to worry about accessing physio or chiro or massage. So we're open, but uh, for people that don't feel safe, or people that don't want to travel, or or you know if they have any security you know safety issues like that, uh, immunocompromised issues, the virtual option is always there. Awesome. Okay, so this week, we're going to talk a little baseball this week, Raj, and a a bit of a a tough blow for the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, In spring training, Nate Pearson suffering a groin injury. Uh, He's going to throw a couple of bullpen sessions, and they're they're not quite sure of his timeline, but it's not looking very good that he's going to be ready for opening day. Explain to us, first of all, what purpose does the groin serve? Well, okay, so to be honest, a groin is not specific, right? So uh, to, to, to the layperson, um, groin just means kind of like the area kind of around the crotch, right, and the inside of the thigh. But um, to someone like me, it, it doesn't give me enough information. Uh, there's muscles in there. There's ligaments in there. It's just a region. So groin is like saying the hip or the butt or the back, but there's so many other issues, uh, area – muscles in that area that we could work with right so the major muscle i'm thinking of he's likely has is something called the adductor which is the muscle on the kind of starts kind of in your crotch region just inside the hip inner thigh and runs down to your knee it's the muscle that's responsible for pulling your leg inwards um, and there's a few adductors in there uh and they called it a strain so again when they use the word strain i'm assuming it's a muscle injury uh so it's probably one of the muscles inside his inner thigh that he's pulled you know, this is an injury that's typically associated with hockey. Um, yep. it, it's a pretty rare injury for, for you know, baseball players outside of pitchers, I think. But um, with a pitcher, I know with hockey, it's one of those injuries that it doesn't seem yep. that serious, but it, they, it can linger and linger and linger. Yep. Uh, is, that, is Nate Pearson looking at the same potential thing? I, I don't I, – I think, A, a because he's a – pitcher it's it's different because it's more on and off you know compared to like a like a hockey player who has to use it a bit more consistently Mm -hmm. so i I think i think a pitcher's recovery probably will will appear to be a bit better now if pitchers do require a lot of power through their legs and they're going because of the torque and the way they spread their legs you know depending on on how they pitch um but i think that's the fact that it's just a different type of sport it's not a purely endurance sport like hockey uh whereas hockey even if you're putting a little bit of stress you're doing it for the whole game or for a while, right? Whereas in, in baseball, there's on and off periods, there's ability to heal and rest. And, you know, there's, it's just, it's very different. You also don't have to play pitchers 
at what they go through rotation of five, right? Mm-hmm. So there's there's a lot of rest period for pitchers, right? Um, so there's there's options there to heal quicker. I, I guess for for people that are playing sports, it, it's a, a pretty valuable lesson that there are certain things that you do in sports where you're putting your body into positions that it normally wouldn't be in. And oh, whenever yeah. you do that, it seems that you're leaving yourself open for injury because, you know, certain things like you think about what a pitcher does and the wind up and the stretch. And that's not a natural thing for your body to do. Right. Oh, no, that's I mean, but that's why they train the way they do. Right. Because uh, range of motion, like like in order for us to move a certain direction or to move as much direction, we need to have the strength to take us there. And most of us have the strength to allow us to function. But athletes have to have a higher level of strength because they need to be able to function at that higher level. Raj, I want to say thank you very much. I want to uh, say that I want to keep it clean, Raj. I'm not going to say any, I'm not going to say anything about your crotch or your groin. So I'll just oh, say Barry, we'll, we'll you talk. Could, to... You couldn't come up with anything today. He thought he was he was growing to say. Oh no! I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> I tried. Well, well joining, joining us from, from sunny, sunny Florida, Florida from his hardworking hard office is Alex Anthopoulos. Alex, every time I see a GM sitting at a desk, it always reminds me of watching Moneyball and seeing the way all those uh, uh, deals transpired. As a GM, I don't even know why I'm starting here, Alex, but as how are you doing, by the way? Let's start with that. You, you no, good. camp's going well, and we got a game at one, and everything's good, but you could jump into it, no problem yes. at all. Uh, when, when, when you see something like that in Moneyball, and you see the way deals are being made in that movie, was that anywhere close to the way it actually really is? No, I mean, I don't think, I wouldn't, let's say, I, I, I wouldn't get on a plane and fly to a guy's office to go <laughs> talk trade like uh, they did with Billy flying to the Indians, but now I will say this. The only time I saw something like that was um, when I was with the Montreal Expos. I remember Doug Melvin was a special assistant for the Boston Red Sox. He had just left the Rangers the year before. Omar Minai was the GM for the Expos. Doug Melvin was in town, and um, and he wasn't scouting this other, but he came in. He knew Omar, and he flew in, and it was to watch the team and to scout Cliff Floyd. And um, But he actually, like, had in-person trade talks, trade conversations, so – the only time I've ever seen it, it was kind of an old school way to do it. It was, it was, it was cool. Um, but I, I'd say the majority of stuff now is done by phone call, by text. Um, I don't think email is all that common. There's times where you might email back and forth some proposals. Um, but I'd say the, the, the majority is right now phone calls and texts. Has COVID and the isolation that sort of has come with it, has it made the job harder to get those signings and get those trades done? No, because I, I think um, we were always communicating by phone and things like that. So I think there's less information, right? We didn't have, you know, player development was significantly impacted last year. We didn't have the affiliates. I didn't have statistics to go off of. Uh, the draft was certainly uh, complicated as well with shortening years, colleges and so on. Um, but in terms of communication, I mean, once the season got going and, and the big league games took place, you felt pretty good about the information you had. It was just like any other year. In terms of, like I said, the amateur talent um, and obviously the young pro talent in the minor leagues, that's a little more challenging. Just you have a lot of incomplete information at this time. Also, Alex, I'd have to think a lot of young players, their growth really kind of got stunted. I mean, sure, they can work out. Sure, they can throw a ball and hit a ball. But to not be able to compete at that high level, how much did it hurt a lot of young players to not have the minor leagues available last year? And so generally in terms of the minor league population, it definitely hurt because a lot of players didn't get to play. You know, we only, we were, we were capped with the number of bodies that we could have. Um, so there's only a select group. Now I do think of those players that were invited to these alternate sites and got to be there. Those players, I think got tremendous development work and it would be like being in, in school. And let's say there's 80 kids in your grade. And let's say 20 of those kids get selected and they get to take part in all the best, teachers and professors and instructors and they get to do basically a summer school let's say for two months and it's pretty intense and it's small classrooms and small environments and you have those people available to you every day all day so those people I think there was tremendous development time so um, all of our coordinators and everybody were at this alternate site so we got a lot of work done and I will say this the eye-opening thing for me and so we we bring all of our players in in spring training before we play a game and just talk to them about their outlook, plans, what the expectations are going to spring training. 
And it's also a time to just to reflect and get feedback and information from them. And one of the things in talking to a lot of these guys this year was the fact that they played each other so much at the alternate site, um, people were able to comment. So if I pitched against a certain hitter, a, a hitter might tell me, I noticed your arm slot here. I noticed you tipped your curveball. You tipped your slider. Normally, they don't interact as much. They don't talk as much. You don't get feedback because you don't play each other, right? So if the Atlanta Braves are playing the Toronto Blue, Blue Jays, for example, the likelihood that um, George Springer is going to tell one of our re relievers, hey, I noticed you were doing something with your hands or I could really see your curveball come out of your hand or um, I noticed something in your delivery. You're not going to have that information. Now, when your teammates, when you're playing each other and you see each other, there was a lot more of that dialogue. And I, some players specifically said I made some adjustments from feedback that I got from those players. Wow. You know, with a lot of the players that we spoke to on the show here, uh, a common theme over 2020 was was how difficult it was to get through with the isolation being away from their family. Um, has Atlanta done anything specifically to address sort of, I guess, the players' mental health uh, going into 2021? Were there lessons that you learned last year? Yeah, it was a challenge and I worry about it. I even think, you know, Freddie Freeman just came into camp and uh, he just had um, two, two new, newborn uh, kids in the off season. And, um, you know, he's now not going to see his family for 42 straight days. Oh, it's, it's crazy, you know, and I know people say these guys make a lot of money and they're star players and so on, but put all that other stuff, their paycheck every two weeks and fame, they're like any, anybody else. And it's tough. I mean, I think about it from my standpoint, um, when I'm away from my family, I get to week three, I'm climbing the walls. So two weeks is tough. I've had it where spring trainings that go three weeks before I get to see them. And it's hard. I struggle with it as, you know, running an organization with our staffs. They're not making the salaries that players are. Um, they report to spring training in the month of February. They're gone. You know, when they're very few of them live in Atlanta. So when they're in Atlanta, they're still on the road and the road games. So you're literally away from your family and hopefully you're playing in October for an ex extremely long period of time. So we try to do what we can to set up family trips, fly families in, the players need to get back. Like you said, though, with the COVID protocols, not easy to do. So um, where we can through rules and being safe and so on, we try to uh, we try to accommodate and do what we can, give as many, and as many resources as we can to staff and players, but it's not easy. And um, I know, Again, we're playing sports and it's entertainment. And I think about the people that are working at grocery stores and things like that, that you know, especially when we were really locked down in the month of April and May, um, how scary that was and the challenges, the things that we were getting day in and day out and the people that, that were going to work. I mean, they have it harder than, than anybody else. We have access to the best trainers, the best doctors. They get a test every other day. I mean, this was a very safe environment for our group. Alex, you think about how much more you have to take on as a GM in 2021 compared to, you know, 2000 even, and how, you know, more and more it's not just about what's going on on the field in baseball. And you think of the stuff with Mickey Calloway and, and how this has really raised a, a major issue about the way people acted maybe 20 years ago to the way people need to be today. Is it something that as a GM you need to address with your staff and make sure that everyone is aware that, you know, especially maybe some of the older guys that have been in the game for a long time, that the way you may have spoken was acceptable 20, 30 years ago, but you can't talk that way anymore. Yeah. I think it's not only in our sport, in every walk of life, in every form, every, yeah. yeah. I think there's just been a lot of, like obviously a lot of things have come to, to, to the for forefront. Um, even from la last summer, um, I think everyone's re-examined their hiring practices, um, how thorough we're all being. I think these are all conversations that need to be had. And look, nobody wants uh, what's happened to occur. But, you know, the one thing that does come out of it, it makes everybody take stock of what they're doing, how they're doing it, makes people look themselves in, in the mirror. Um, I do know that across the board, I think most clubs, almost all of them, everyone's re-examining how they're doing things. Um, so it's obviously you know, really sad, unfortunate, all those things of what's come to light here these last few months and even la last summer in terms of the world and, and society. Um, but it's also an opportunity now for people to finally have a conversation and if everybody to start to make in impactful change. 
you know, it's funny, we spoke with Latroy Hawkins a few weeks ago, and he said something, he echoed something very similar. He said, as difficult as this time is right now, it seems like people are finally taking steps in the right direction to address these at a systemic level and, and actually make some progress. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, I definitely agree. I think, you know, look, I've made me take stock of all kinds of things and have conversations with my wife and friends and family, and that's what we should be doing. But, you know, you just don't want to have conversations and, you know, people can put out statements and I, you know, I don't condone this and I'm against this or for you know, statements are not, it's not action, right? It's, it's strictly a statement. So I think we're seeing more people take action and that what is what will ultimately impact change. Um, and I see it across the board. I mean, people are, you know, there's been significant discussion and I know people are starting to do more. It isn't enough, clearly. Um, but the fact that we're moving in the right direction is certainly a plus. Alex, we can sit here all day and talk real serious, but I, I want to lighten the mood a little bit with you. And, uh, you know, you spent a lot of time with, with the Toronto Blue Jays organization and in Toronto. And we do a little thing when we have our guests on where we show a few pictures and you kind of recall the memories of the pictures. So I'm going to do that and we're going to have some fun. And I'm not going to show you that one yet. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to show you a couple of pictures and you're going to tell me what you remember. So we'll start with this one. What do you remember about this moment? This was, I believe, when we clinched in Baltimore. Yeah. Um, yeah, just, you know, for me, what I remember about that day was, I think it was the second game of a doubleheader, or maybe the first game, but we were blowing them out 10 to 1 or something. So I was getting a ton of texts from my family, I think, in the fifth inning, sixth inning. And, you know, you get emotional at the time just because it was, you just knew the grind to get back there. And, you know, winning the division is a big deal. Howard Starkman, who's still with the organization, I believe. And he always told me, he said, it's harder to win a division than it is to win a, a World Series. So don't get me wrong. I'd love to, to be able to have a debate with him on it. and be able to <laughs> um, But um, now it was a really emo emotional time for me, um, just with the text and everything else and the impact. And, um, you know, it's you get the chills when you talk about it. It's just knowing the, the joy and how happy everyone was. And just really proud of that group of players. Alex, where did you f just remind us? Where did you find Munenori Kawasaki? Because one of the most interesting, unique, entertaining, uplifting guys was he going to hit 300? No, but you know what? He had good at bats. He just brought something to the team. How important was he to the to the team, just from a moral standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I've talked about this a lot. So you know, there's guys that are become glue guys and bring guys together and impact other players and they make, you know, we play every day and it's a grind and they keep the mood light and keep people upbeat and make it a good clubhouse environment. I do think that certainly helps you win games. Um, and the guy in the background there, who's got his ring and a Andrew Tintinish in the background yeah. right to my right, if you're staring at the screen, he's the one I'm 99% sure he did the, the deal. He definitely did one of those, but I believe he was the one that brought him to the table. He signed him as a minor league free agent, he's the one who believed in him. Um, so he certainly deserves the, the credit for uh, being able to bring in the Toronto. Alex, when you uh, think about a lot of the players you've had, you've had a lot of what they call reclamation projects or guys that people maybe have give, had given up on and then they ended up having a pretty decent career. And uh, here's one right here. What did this moment mean for you to be there with Jose when – I mean, you think about Jose Bautista, the day that he became a Blue Jay from Pittsburgh. Uh, obviously, there were people in the Blue Jays organization that saw something in him that many didn't. You ended up signing him to that incredible deal, like, uh, you know, team-friendly deal. Um, just talk about your relationship with Jose and, and what that moment meant for you. Yeah, I obviously spent a lot of time with him. Unbelievable player, incredibly bright. Um, you know, I know... I knew the work and the time that he put into it, and what it meant to him and how important Toronto and Canada was to him. And I felt like he had gone through the rough years along with me, right? I felt like we were there together at the same time. So my first year as a GM in 2010 was the first year he had real success. And then, you know, signing him to the extension. And I know everyone said after the fact, oh, you know, it ended up being a good deal for the club. But, you know, at the time that we did the deal, I don't think anyone thought it was a uh, some great contract. We paid a significant amount of money um, for a guy who had done it one time. And I had my doubts. I mean, we did it, obviously, I believe in doing the deal, but 
I've told this story before that I think two, three days after we did the deal, I remember driving to the ballpark to spring training, questioning myself, like, did we do the right thing? This is a lot of money. So knowing him, the work ethic and how, what he, how, what it meant to him to win and how good the club was and that we finally got there. He had lived through all the downtimes. Um, it was pretty exciting. And also, you know, the fact that, you know, for, for me, a big part of winning, I look back when I got to the, to the Blue, Blue Jays, you had guys like Halliday, Carlos Delgado, that their best moments as Blue Jays were Carlos Delgado's four home runs or Halliday winning the Cy Young. And a postseason moment for the great star players, that's what it's about. And the fact that he has the bat flip, we'll talk about that forever. People in Toronto certainly will, and certainly across Canada. And even Edwin Encarnacion, I wasn't there, but the wild card, the walk off, mm -hmm. you know, he has his postseason moments. And that's, you know, that's the great part about it. Jose did amazing things during the year all star games, home runs, all that stuff. But people will link him to a postseason moment, which is the way it should be. And it makes me sad. And it's not to be critical of anything that Del Delgado was a Hall of Fame caliber player. Like, we don't have a postseason moment. It's not his fault. Just, you know, those teams, right, wrong, or indifferent, didn't end up getting there. But, you know, in Roy Halladay, the same way, when you see all these highlights of Roy Halladay with the Phillies, you have, you know, the game against Miami, but the playoff games, you know, and I wish that had been in the Toronto Blue Jays, you know, been, been with the Blue Jays. But I think that's what probably gives me the greatest satisfaction that the world got a chance to see these elite players and they've represented Toronto really well. If there's one signing, and it's probably, you probably already answered it, I would, I would assume it's most likely Bautista, but if there's one signing as you look back and you think, we got it right, you know, as, as a GM or for my team, I got it right, um, and that you're proud of, who would it be over and above all the others? Ooh, good one. Um, over and above, you know, um, no, look, the Batista and Encarnacion deals, they were good the whole way, the length of their deals, right? That doesn't happen very often that you sign a guy and they're healthy pretty much the whole time. They're productive the whole time. The contracts work out. Um, so those are the two that come to mind um, off the top of my head because, look, at the time that we signed Batista, like he had only done it once. And there was just this uncertainty and we weren't there. I'd only been there a year as a GM and we were trying to rebuild. And all of a sudden he was 29 or 30 years old to do this extension and it has to accelerate things, right? Because we can't take another four or five years to rebuild. So, um, and then Edwin Encarnacion, there was a lot of debate about, you know, is he, he had, and we did it at the all-star break. He had a nice year. Um, was the performance real? Did he turn it around? I know people had been calling for his head for a while we had signed him the year prior um, to that deal the one-year deal with an option and I think through the beginning of June he didn't he hadn't hit a home run him and Aaron Hill had not hit a home run through the first two months of the year and then I remember we had the DFA a player and it was going to be Juan Rivera or Edwin Encarnacion and that's how low things had fallen for him that it was a discussion Juan Rivera Edwin Encarnacion who's going to go that year so we obviously kept Edwin. It was the right choice. And then he ended the year pretty well. We exercised the option for the following year and he got off to a great start, but he had shown flashes before, but had really turned it around and signing him to a, the time, I think it was three years and 27 million or $28 million deal. It's a big commitment for a guy we were paying two and a half. So, um, you know, but it's a credit to both of those guys. They took care of themselves. They worked hard and they wanted to be in Toronto. You, know, you mentioned speaking like, about oh, go ahead, Tom. Sorry, Barry. Yeah, speaking about length of term. Um, you know, Toronto's obviously kind of always been known for for capping uh, how long a contract uh, they give out to to their players. What goes through your mind? Now? I mean, obviously you're with Atlanta now. When you see a, a deal like uh, Fernando Tatis Jr. for 13 years, is that something that you know? would go across your desk in, in Atlanta and be a possibility? Or would you still shy away, even not being with Rogers anymore? Would you still shy away from a deal that long? Yeah, so that was our CEO at the time, Paul Beeston, had a philosophy of five-year contract length. And um, I understood it. I mean, again, you have your ground rules and so on. But, you know, he was lenient with it. I mean, I when we traded for Tulo, um, he had five years left. So we traded for him during the year. And he had another five years, I believe, beyond that. Right. So, and Reyes had two. So, 
in theory, too low when we acquired him at more than five years left on his deal. So I don't remember it ever being an issue where um, we walked away from a player because I wanted to give him a six or seven year contract and we had this rule in place. So I don't remember that ever being an issue. So look, like obviously when a player is a young player, like a Fernando Tatis and so on, 21, 22 years old, I, I think, you know, again, I don't want to speak for Paul, but his general philosophy on that was more free agent deals. Um, and just because, you know, most guys are hitting, very few guys are hitting free agency at 26 or 27, right? Most guys are in their, their 30s. So I guess I'd heard, you know, they had had policies of three-year deals when Pat Gillick was there and they had moved it up to five. So I think it was his, Paul's own little rule of thumb. Uh, it was never this hard mandate and it never really came into play. So I always believe that for the right player and the right talent, I would have been able to sit Paul down and have that conversation with him. And if it was a young free agent, like we saw with Manny Machado or Bryce Harper, um, those guys were young guys. I think the, you know, Paul would have said, look, you know, I understand these guys are young, young guys and, you know, he would have been very open-minded to doing, you know, something more than that. I think that was just a guardrails in, you know, when guys are starting <laughs> to get older. I think when Blue Jay fans look back at all the deals you made, I think uh, getting this guy in Toronto was probably the one that really looks set you know, the deal that really changed the organization. And then you had him again in Atlanta. Um, were you surprised that you were able to get JD when you did uh, in that deal with the Oakland A's? No, no. Um, surprised? No. Just, I mean, once, I guess, once you start talking, right, you're not surprised because then you know that at least, you know, once, I bet when you're talking trades, you can kind of get a sense, is this real or not? Is a team engaging you or are they not really engaging you? So, no, I've said this before. Oakland was not motivated to trade him. Um, I just called Billy quite quite a bit. And, um, you know, I, I, I'd say this too, similar to the Batista contract. When we did the Batista contract. I remember telling Batista when he came into my office to sign his deal, I remember saying, man, five years. It's going to be 34 in the last year of the deal. And um, I was like, yeah, this is a long time. I said it right to his face, you know, like this is, you know, and he's like, what are you worried? He's like, you stare at this body. He's like, I want to be fine. And um, said, I know, man, it's a long time. So I can tell you when we did the Donaldson deal, I mean, we, we wanted to do it. We obviously did it, but we did not pump a fist. We weren't excited. We were, we really liked the young players we were sending out the door. So again, you don't know how young players are going to emerge and evolve, but um, we felt we were giving up a lot of really good, talented players that we felt we needed Josh. At the same time, he was a durable player, four years of control. Um, he fit exactly what we wanted to do, but we we swallowed hard in doing that deal and it didn't come together that fast. And I remember when it, we finally agreed to it, it was one of those deals like the Batista deal, like I'm doing this deal, I believe in this, but I don't know that there's all that many trades that you feel like are easy to make. You always think about the other side and things that can go wrong and now you start dreaming about Barreto and Lori and all these guys, you know, their talent is through the roof, what they might be. And you're getting one player back. And if he gets hurt or he doesn't play, play well. So um, look, he obviously was even better than we would have thought winning the MVP and so on. Jeff, he definitely changed the mentality. And, you know, uh, the one thing that stuck out to me too with, with Josh was I remember talking to him one time in that, in that year that we had him, um, we were in the, in the lounge and I remember just asking, it may have been July or August, whenever it was, I said, you know, I said, tell me about Toronto and guys, you know, the, the perception that guys don't want to come here and so on. I said, you think it's the whole ES, not having ESPN? You'd always hear these things, right? About why people supposedly didn't want to come. And, you know, he gave the most honest answer you could have. He goes, it doesn't have anything to do with that. He's like, you guys didn't, didn't win. And you guys start winning. People want to be here. It's a great place to be. And you know what, when you think back, he was right because all those years when, you know, Paul Gillick, Paul Beeston and Pat Gillick were running the team, they were bringing in big time free agents. And certainly they were paying what they needed to pay. And that's what happens in free agency. But guys wanted to come to Toronto. They were a winning team. They're a great team. Star caliber guys like Clemens and Paul Molitor and Jim Winfield, and Dave Stewart. I mean, these are elite level guys and they were bringing them all in. People wanted to play for the Toronto Blue Jays. So, um, and Toronto has become that much more exciting a city and a, a dynamic city and so on. So, I never, you know, ultimately that is as simple as a response as it was, it made sense. And, um, you know, it really comes down to that, you know, as long as you're competitive from a contractual standpoint, your opportunity to win is really the key, key thing.
Alex, you may not have been doing any fist pumps, but I know me personally, I was doing my Jonah Hill, and when you made that deal, I was thrilled. Uh, you know, you, 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 had, you had Josh back in Atlanta. You had Jose in Atlanta. I look now, you've got Ryan Goins in camp. You've got Mark Frostad as, as one of your athletic trainers. Um, are, are you just, is that one of part of the loyalty in you that if you've worked with somebody and you trust and you believe in them in, in what they do, whether it be a player or a coach or someone that's, you know, uh, another part of the staff that, that you like to always keep them in the back of your mind when it comes to building your own staff? You know, I think anybody that has ties to me or connections to me, that's obviously that's going to be the assumption there. First and foremost, um, we're bringing in a player or we bring in a staff member because we think they can help them win. You know, there's an expression, friends will get you fired, So, which is true. So I have a lot of friends in, in the game. I worked a lot of places, a lot of people that I know. I will only bring someone in. And ultimately, I find the bar is higher. And right? if you've been around a player or if you've been around an employee, um, because of expectations and so on. And you just, you have to be mindful of previous relationships. So, you know, I think it's harder at times if you have a previous relationship, because there is that sense of loyalty and so on. And I'll tell you with Jose Batista, um, mm. again, 2018, my first year, I didn't know what we had. I didn't necessarily know we were going to be a playoff team. Um, I just know we didn't have a whole lot of depth. I was worried about the offense and we needed to play third base. And, um, you know, there still was some upside there. And obviously, you know, there was a thought that he was going to sign a long-term deal to stay in Toronto and things, you know, he signed a one-year deal and became a free agent. So um, there's always a comfort with, with familiarity, but first and foremost, it has to come down to talent. So there's plenty of former players I've been around. We brought Josh in and gave him a huge contract because we felt like he could be an MVP caliber player again. You know, Ryan Goins is in camp on a minor league deal competing for a bench body utility spot and so on. So, um, you know, but it's because we think he's a good player. So it's it's nice when I've got inside information. I know what makes them tick. I know the makeup, both employees and players. But I, I can tell you, no doubt about it, um, every decision is based, based on we think someone can help the team. You know, the, the ways that they can help the team, having a background with someone like that, um, as, a, as a scout, as a former scout yourself, you know, does it help you measure those intangibles that aren't covered by the numbers? Because it's, it's become such a numbers game with, with scouts and, you know, how fast the spin rate is on a fastball, how fast the bat swing is, but is having that background with them and knowing those intangibles, those things that drive them, does that make these decisions easier and a little bit easier to bring them aboard? Yeah, there's no doubt. I think, um, you know, in terms of employees, there's no, you can jump right in, you know, exactly strengths and weaknesses and so on of your employees. So from a training staff standpoint, we have George Poulos, Mike Frost, Jeff Stevenson as well. They all work for the Toronto Blue Jays. I know all three, three guys. So I know how they work. I know how they think. If they're telling me they're looking at someone's file and the likelihood they think a guy's going to hold up or break down, I know how they operate and I have a good sense of how to read their information. Same way if you read someone's scouting report, you have a scout. Some guys grade position players higher, position players lower. Some guys are more attracted to speed players. So knowing that and not have, having the, the learning curve of a new employee certainly helps. In terms of players, I am a firm believer in players can make other guys around them improve through various ways. There's only so much a coach can do. And sometimes you need to hear it from a, from a peer. So, you know, I think it was a Sports Illustrated article after Jose Batista had his breakout year and as, as much as rightfully so people talked about Cito Gaston and Dwayne Murphy, Gene Tennis and so on that had worked with Jose on getting ready on time and starting early. Jose talked about a conversation he had with Vernon Wells late in the year in the month of August about getting ready on time and something that Vernon said to him really clicked even though he had been hearing it all summer from those guys and they had been working that conversation with Vernon unlocked that one big game he had and then it carried through to an amazing September where I think he had nine home runs and carried over into 2010 and obviously be, became a star. So, um, and I saw it with Jose Batista impacting Edwin Encarnacion, the way he took care of himself, the way he approached the game, the way he prepared, all those things. So I know Troy Tulowitzki had an impact on Ryan Goins. So um, players have impact on other players, the way they prepare, the way they work. But Troy Hawkins, I thought was tremendous for our bullpen. At the time we had Roberto Osuna, Aaron San Sanchez, um, you know, what he brought there, the influence, um, the way he went, went about it. So 
you acquire people for what they can do on the field, but that little added extra that they can bring as an example for young players, I think is extremely important. Alex, we're going to bring our studio audience in in just a moment, but there's one more thing that I do need to show you. Tom and I are both musicians. We're in a band together, and I swear you're going to be sorry you ever showed me this video, but for those who have not seen it yet, um, explain a little bit about what we're seeing right now because you're... Man, there's some serious rocking going on here. Yeah, so I, you know, I didn't play a whole lot of sports growing up. I snowboarded in the winter. I skied earlier, and I snowboarded. And then I played the bass. Um, my two older brothers played the guitar and the drums. We had a studio in our house, and instead of going in the backyard and playing catch, we would go jam, right? We call it jam for people that don't play musical. And, and so we would do that. And then in school. Um, the school I went to, Lower Canada College at the time, they had a really good program. They had a jazz band, they had a blues band. Uh, so we traveled to Memphis for jazz competition and blues competition in New Orleans um, for those competitions as well. And I played bass in those bands. Um, and I just played in a lot of bands and I don't play as often now, but um, you know, I love playing, you know, I love playing a ton. So this is, this is a lady that uh, grew up with us. Uh, in Montreal, and her el eldest son, who's on, on the right of that screen, he plays in all kinds of bands, and we were there seeing them for the holidays, myself and my other my other brother who plays the drums, so he had a little studio in his house, so we were there for the holidays just to see the lady that took care of us for years, and we would go back about an hour north of the city, and uh, he said, hey, why don't we go down and jam, you know, so he just started playing some stuff, and he'd always want to end up playing with us, so... Just like going to play play catch, right? He had a bass, drums, you just grab it, and I don't know, we were playing whatever. He started going into Sweet Home Chicago or whatever, and um, I would start playing. So it's fun. I played in a lot of groups and bands, and I enjoyed doing it. It's probably the thing I enjoyed doing the most beyond uh, work. Well, Tom's a bass player, and a very, very good bass player. So he's watching this, and well, what do you, what are you thinking, Tom, of Alex's chops? A couple things jump out to me. Uh, you've got really good two finger movement. <laughs> um not not using a pick no uh, and, I never you, use and a you pick. yeah excellent um no, i'm the same I, I i would only use a pick if i've been playing too much my fingers were getting blistered right but uh you're you're doing walking lots of pentatonics your hands kind of going all over that but you're actually playing one of my favorite bases that looks like a 70s jazz bass trapezoid yeah. inlays do you still have it yeah, so I owned a Fender Jazz Bass. Um, I never played with a pick. I didn't like the sound. I thought it was like a tinny sound to use a pick. Um, my favorite bass player is John Paul Jones. Um, I just mm -hmm. love just in a John John Bond in the same way. The way they locked in together, I thought it was really you know me and my brother would call it because it just it was fat. You know the way they just kind of played it was a fat yeah. heavy uh, groove and. Um, it's, um, you know, yeah, in terms of getting calluses, I find I would only get calluses if I hadn't played for a while. If I hadn't, let's say I hadn't played for a little while and I, and it, only when I got older, I used to play the bass each day, but once I stopped playing bass as often, I'd get calluses and that would be a problem. And I'd get soreness on the top of my hand. So, but beyond that, um, I never really had problems. And when I was in shape, playing it was good. And when I wasn't, it would probably take me a month or so. <laughs> Does that bring back good memories when you see that, or is it is it embarrassing? Like, what's it like for you to see that? Uh, you know what? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of wish, you know, we're getting our kids. I have a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old. They're playing the piano now, and I wish I had played the piano when I was younger. And, you know, obviously playing the bass and reading sheet music and reading bass clef, and now they're starting to read sheet music, treble clef, and so on. Um, I enjoyed it, and I think just playing an, playing an instrument is really good from a developmental standpoint as well. Um, and again, like you could just do it for hours, right? And just create and have fun and just get lost in the moment when you're playing. Um, and we would just do it. We didn't script anything. We would just go down and just jump in a bass drum or I would start a bass line and then boom, go. Two hours later, we're still going on something else. Well, we, we've never jammed before, but once once your baseball days are done, we, we, we got to get a jam going because I'd love to, to, love to do it. Yeah. Well, hopefully by then we'll be allowed to actually perform live again. <laughs> it's been hard. All right, uh, Alex, we've got uh, six uh, of our uh, out-of-the-park insiders who are going to join us now. 
and they've been watching uh, very patiently as we've been doing this. So we're going to bring them all in, and uh, we're going to allow them to uh, all ask you a question. So that would be nice. And uh, all of them, very big Blue Jays fans, so you may not get a lot of uh, Atlanta Braves questions. Y y you may, but we'll see. Uh, so we're all they're all coming in right now here. And there we go. So let's begin. Uh, let's begin with Sue, who uh, is uh, just below Tom here. Sue, say hello to Alex. And if you have a question for Alex, uh, go for it. Hi, Alex. I Can you hear you. me? Sorry? Can you hear OK? Yes, yes I, I, hear, I hear you great. OK, great to see you. You look great. Thank you so much for yeah. doing it. Thank you, Barry and Tom, for arranging it. Just a quick question. I know. Uh, John Gibbons was on your staff last year as a scouting in the scouting area. Is he coming back with you this year? Yeah, he's back. Um, he's still in scouting with us. You know, the one thing I noticed when he managed was he just had a very good opinion of players. And <laughs> I've talked about this before. I, you know, there's you work together with when you're a GM. And a lot of times you're thinking, you know, the manager obviously doesn't have time to, to learn the league and know what's going on. But his opinion, when I look back about players who we should keep, who we should get rid of, what we needed to do, he was spot on. Yeah. He had a very good feel for players. And not all of them, not every manager is a great evaluator of talent. A lot of them are good at what they do. They're in-game, connecting with players. But when you have a guy that can do both, it's pretty pretty great. And he always had a really good eye for, for talent, so he's still uh, along with us. Good. So thank, you. thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, Fiona, you're up next. Uh, you're on with Alex Anthopoulos. Hi, Alex. How you doing? Good, thanks. How are you? Good. I had a question, but Tom kind of touched on it, so I won't. I won't ask it. Tom, <laughs> so, come on, man. <laughs> it's okay. So I'll just say it was really interesting to get a different perspective on baseball. That was because um, usually we're listening to players, so it was very interesting to have it from a GM perspective. So thank you for that. What was the question that Tom? Uh, talked about her. her <laughs> I was just going, just going to say that obviously <laughs> player stats are really important when you're looking at building a team, but I just wondered if, if things like personality, leadership skills, work ethic played a role in choosing players also. Yeah, it does. And to this day, I still struggle with what the percentage is, right? So, you know, Pat Gillick had a, a quote that he said, I think he said when he first started, it was, uh, 80% talent, 20% makeup character. And then as he had more experience, it was 70, 30, or it was 70, 30 at the beginning and then 60, 40. And I think that happened to me as well. Um, and, you know, I just, I sometimes, I, I wonder if I overvalue it now because I've had success doing it. I didn't have a success early on it because I didn't really pay attention to it. My view of getting character and makeup was, oh, I'll grab a Henry Blanco and a Mark DeRosa. So one or two of 25, they're good guys. And uh, we'll put them in the clubhouse. And it really doesn't work that way. You, know, you need to, in my mind, flood the clubhouse with quality people. Now, they have to play first. So if you're looking at a pool of players, you have to decide, okay, which 30 players, let's say, do you want or 20? And then of those, which ones meet your criteria for quality teammates and character? And then you really go after those guys. And if you want to bring in one or two questionable guys um, that you don't think will bring down the group, sure, but you have the 23 to overpower them, right? And it's just like anything else when you're, you, have, you have kids or people you're around or you're hanging out, a group of individuals. If everyone's leaning or trending in a certain direction, even if you're not wired the same way, you're kind of forced to go along with it. So if people work hard and do the right thing, it cert certainly helps. So um, I still have a hard time sometimes I walk away from really good, talented players that I can get, I think, at a, a pretty good price because I'm worried about how they're going to impact their other young players. And I wonder at times if I've overdone it, but, you know, not to be arrogant about this, but, you know, my last, I've been three years in Atlanta now, so four years as a GM, we've won the division, and I've really been strict about who we bring in. And it might just be that we have good players, but I like to think that the makeup and the character part is pretty important too. Not a bad. I was actually a better answer than when Tom asked it. So Fiona, I'm glad right. I'm she glad. asked it better than me. So she did. She did. Uh, Fiona, thank you so much, Alex. One of the great things about Blue Jay fans is that they come from all over the world, and uh, we're gonna head to the UK now, where David joins us. David, what time is it right now where you are? Uh, it's quarter to six. Just sort wow. of done a thing. Nice. Uh, what's your question for Alex, David? Hi, Alex. Nice to speak to you. Speak to you too. Um, I was just wondering, obviously Tom asked about the kind of biggest trade and stuff. I was wondering 
looking back to like 2015 and stuff, what who would you say was kind of one of the most underrated players? Someone that kind of had a big impact, but maybe wasn't one of the superstars? Ooh, good question. I'm trying to think. So we had um, obviously Martin and Navarro, Colabello obviously did an unbelievable job, you know, Goins and then Tulo, uh, Ben Revere, Donaldson, I'm trying to just think of the roster, right? Batista. Um, I got to tell you, I felt like everybody did pull their own weight and they all, and that's why I was so proud of that team. They all pulled together so well. They they linked everybody else up. There was a continuity. A, there was a camaraderie in the clubhouse. You know, when you don't have a great clubhouse, you walk down as a GM, you kind of feel it, right? And I remember talking to Mark Burley after 2014. You know, I'll, I'll call players in the offseason and say, hey, what do you, you, know, you played with so-and-so. What do you think of this person, that person? I remember just having a very candid conversation with him saying, I'm just so sick of this group. You know, not ripping anybody to shreds, but I'm just like, I'm done. I'm done. Cause you're starting to cut corners and go with talented guys that I know are not the best people in the world and the best influences. And um, then we started to make trades and um, acquiring guys. And I remember he sent me a text and he said, man, you were not joking about that conversation we had, you know? And um, you know, and I look at, I felt like we were so strict. I remember that spring training in 20, 2015, we had some opportunities to bring in talented players that, would have filled some needs, um, but they had questionable character and makeup. And I was tempted to do it. And it was like, it was like trying to grab the, the forbidden fruit, you know, like you wanted to take a bite of the apple, but I didn't do it. And I stuck with it. And there were some moments where I almost, you know, you, when you're, when you need talent and you have problems, you might just start to cut corners and you lower your bar a little bit, but we stuck with it. And then we were really specific about who we acquired 2015. Ben Revere was a, Great teammate, high energy, great guy. Mark Lowe, good guy. Price, his reputation was off the charts. Um, Latroy Hawkins, was his reputation was off the charts as well. So uh, that was a big part of everybody that we brought in. We thought they were talented first and foremost, but everybody that we brought in fit in so well and guys were so excited. And I'll tell you, I know that people didn't log in to talk about Atlanta, but um, last year, obviously we lost to game seven in the NLCS and uh, we had a lot of really experienced guys in our room and um, a bunch of them told me it's the best clubhouse they had ever been in in their, their entire career. And they've been in a lot of teams. And that's the thing that was most gratifying to me because I feel like that's the part that we shouldn't get wrong as a front office, right? Like we're going to make mistakes and guys that get hurt, guys don't perform well, they're human beings. But if you just take the time and you actually have priorities and values, you should get that part right. And it was pretty awesome to see how everybody got together. And you're almost like a proud father. You walk through the clubhouse and you see people sitting around together, talking baseball, really enjoying being around each other. Like the vibe, the glow, I get the goosebumps when I talk about it. It's such a cool environment to be in. And that's rewarding as a GM because you're thinking like, wow, we put that, we put that together. Now, obviously these are good competitive clubs. So how much does the winning impact it? But teammates genuinely enjoy each other. And that's what we had in Toronto that these guys genuinely, genuinely liked, you know, each other and the group. And uh, it was amazing to see. So I don't know that there's one guy specifically because they all kind of had their own role, but the, the group together was great. Alex, you're, you'd hear what people say, you know, what happens when you make deals and there's going to be people that like the deals and people that don't, how did you respond or how do you respond to those who say that the deals that were made in 2015 pretty much emptied the cupboard for prospects because that's the one thing that you know the people that love you say it was the greatest moves because it got the team back to the postseason those on the other side of the fence say well he got rid of all the all the great prospects now I know there were definitely still some prospects left but was that the hardest thing about making those deals is trying to figure out how do you sacrifice this to get this because you need to win and you need to give up something to get something yeah I mean I heard it I mean it doesn't bother me I mean it's just when you're a GM you're going to be criticized and all time. But you know, to me, it's like, don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. So, you know, um, the facts were that we could have traded Roberto Osuna in that off season going into 2015, he was, you know, pitched in the Arizona fall league, it pitched an a ball had come off. Tommy John did not throw well. We could have got Greg Holland for him. It was an established closer. We didn't do it. Um, you know, tra- actually Travis, I think would have been in that deal deal too. 
Um, and even at the trade deadline, I talked about this too. Um, Ra- Ra- a guy like Ra- Rowdy Telez was one of the big hangups in getting Ben Zobrist. And because Batista and Encarnacion, I think, have two years of control left, and we knew that at some point we were going to have to get some zero to two, some guys that made minimum salaries, and Telez had good offensive power, um, on base skills, and so on. And we didn't just want to part with him. Liam Hendricks was one other guy that was asked about in that deal, too. So, um, you know, that was that same summer. So we ran out of money at the trade deadline. We had $7 million left. We used that last $7 million on price. Uh, we had actually tried to get Hap from Seattle uh, on the last day. And um, the Pirates were willing to take on salary. I needed them to – Seattle to pay the entire salary. That's why Mark Lowe was – part of it was – he made very, you know, few dollars. And, um, you know, if you remember, we acquired – Cliff Pennington at the end of August, mm-hmm. and we had Arizona pay down a salary and we had to trade prospects. So, um, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, the facts were that we were out of money. And that July, we signed Vlad Guerrero to, you know, the equivalent of $6 million. It was $4 million signing bonus. We had to pay a tax. Um, so that's $6 million. I could have easily said, I'm not signing a 15 year old prospect. I'm going to put that towards the big, the big league club. Let's go trade for the J Haps or whoever. But or we're going to throw Telez into this deal to get Ben Zobris to get it done. Um, and obviously, I look back at Ben Zobris if we had gotten him, would we have gotten to the World Series? So, um, the reality of it is, there was a lot of times where uh, we didn't trade young players. The guys that we did trade, I mean, we liked them, but we didn't want to trade um, a bunch of our prospects. We held on to a lot of them. I had every expectation that I was going to stay. This thought that I knew I was gone, I mean. I was ready to sign a contract extension in the month of August. So that was after the trade deadline. And I, you know, and, um, you know, I was just, I was given advice that maybe I should just wait a little bit and not jump into doing anything. So only in September is the first time I ever thought for a minute, I wouldn't be back with the Toronto Blue Jays. So my thought was always on being there for a long period of time. There was no trade everybody away or do any of that kind of stuff.